Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. Eight minutes past ten o'clock on a Saturday morning. This is the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show and uh, Rob Cameron... We have a special guest on the line, as we often do at this time of the day. We do, uh, and it fits well with both our sporting and musical themes of this show, because this bloke himself is a mighty fine performer. Uh, I've seen some of his very, very best work in the music world. A great appreciator of good music, and I bet you any money you like, he was singing along with that tune in the background as well. He is a two-time Essendon Football Club Premiership player, a three-time Essendon Football Club Best and Fairest player, and he's had... 63 or 4 constant years of involvement with football at the highest level. That's got to be a world record. John Burt, good morning and welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show. Thank you, Rob. Very That's good to have you aboard. Now, not a bad intro, was it? Uh, we, very good, uh, especially the music bit. I can't recall being a music... Uh, I'm a music freak. Love music, but as a performer... No. Mate, I've seen you performing. I've seen you on the social media network performing... Uh, with guitar in hand and uh, pump, pumping out some really, really good stuff. So don't tell me you're not a performer. I've seen you. It was all miming. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, John, it's good to have you back. It's been too long. I've um, I've enjoyed the three or four times you've been on the show already, but we've got you on because there's something happening at your footy club that you're directly or indirectly involved in, and, and it's about history. We love going back into history of clubs, great players, great periods, and there was a great period at the Essendon Footy Club that you were involved in uh, in the 60s when you played in those couple of premiership sides and played with, when when it all gets analysed back, some of the greats of your club's history, and when you put them all together on one team on one day, probably one of the one of the very best teal teams the Essendon Footy Club ever fielded. Well, I was very privileged um, because I had two two coaches at Essendon and uh, two of the two greatest players that ever played and great coaches in Dick Reynolds and John Coleman. And then uh, one of my three captains whilst I was there was my hero, Billy Hutchison. So I was at Essendon in a terrific era. Yeah, and really good. There's lots of other names. Ken Fraser, Barry Davis, Bluey Shelton, um, Jack Clark, just legends of the club. But it was just one of those eras where they all lined up, similar to uh, the, the Carlton teams where they got all those great Bendigo players, but they come together with with Duel and Nichols and Walls and Jezelenko. It was just that the stars all lined up at the right time, but I don't think that that, that team in that period uh, would be embarrassed to sit amongst the greatest uh, that ever played the game. Oh, I think it was a great team, and there were maybe a few country blokes in that team, like I think Bluey Shelton and myself and one or two others but where Essendon was very lucky they were able to get so many great players from the Essendon District League and you mentioned Jack Clark and you mentioned Ken Fraser and Barry Davis and these guys, Bobby Sheeran and Huey Mitchell, all came from the Essendon District League and uh, uh, probably only about no more than half a dozen out of about 45 or so players came from the country or interstate. Uh, Essendon was very lucky at that time. So where did you start your footy career, John? How did you get to Essendon? Well, I, uh, I lived in Ballarat and um, I was very fortunate to um, attend the school, Ballarat College. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 1954, I've got to get this out, we beat St. Patrick's College for the first time <laughs> in 49 years. You love telling that story, don't you, John? <laughs> I, love, I love that story. And uh, I know there's a guy, a friend of mine listening to it that went to St. Pat's. And he gets a bit embarrassed when I talk about it. But you asked me the question how I got to Essendon. And uh, fortunately for me, Dick Reynolds and Howard Oakey, chairman of selectors at Essendon at the time, were at the game. And in 1954, I met the great Dick Reynolds. And uh, we became firm friends. And uh, he became friends of my family, my parents. And uh, I was just fortunate enough to be uh, captain of that team that won that game in 1954 and I'll keep repeating it with my <laughs> greatest, uh, greatest thrill I think I've ever had in footy. Uh, John, just going back to the Essendon team, this, we had a lot of discussion recently about making the most of your moment and your eras and we've had uh, Richmond's three premierships, we've had um, the, the Brisbane 
three. We had the, the period where Hawthorne won three in a row. During the 60s, um, Essendon won those two, but we also had the situation when St Kilda had a great side, won their first ever flag. You beat them in 1965. And we also had a Geelong side that won in 63 that was led by Farmer, Goggin and Wade and probably, looking back, may have underachieved. So while we say great Essendon team and playing in... Um, in a, in a great era, it must have been a great era for footy with the amount of serious competition you had uh, during that period. It was a great era, and you know you talk about uh, players from the clubs such as Bulldog and Polly Farmer uh, at St Kilda and also Geelong. But I'd like to just mention something here that in that era between 1962 and 65, uh, Essendon won two, but we missed out in 63 and 64. And there's two guys from Ballarat that are writing a book at the moment. It's about the years from 62 to 65. And what will come out in that is why we didn't win in 63, 64. What happened to Essendon? Because I think in that era, Essendon was certainly the best team, always up there in 63, 64. But why didn't we win in 63, 64 or go better? And uh, the book written by two Ballarat gentlemen, Michael Carney and Phil Hoey. They're analysing all of this and uh, talking to all the players. It's not a book about statistics. It's a book about stories and uh, why. Uh, so it's a very interesting book. It's coming out next year in the centenary year, about uh, March, April or so on. Uh, so I've got the plug-in about the book, but you asked the question... And I think Essendon overall in that five-year period was certainly the best team. Yeah. Um, f- funny you, you you talk about that, that what what happened, why didn't they? And, and you could look at those three sides I mentioned, why didn't they do better with those great sides? Ess- the Essendon side that Sheedy coached around 2000 where they only won one premiership and were clearly the best side in the competition for three if not four years but only got uh, one trophy. You, you ask yourself why, but you've been involved playing, coaching, uh, general manager of, of many AFL, VFL clubs, you don't, need too, you don't need too much to go right or go wrong at crucial times that uh, opportunities are missed, I guess. No, you, uh, you're right about that. Uh, it could be an administrative uh, problem of uh, not recruiting a player that you had an opportunity to recruit or letting players go that you shouldn't have let go, like Essen in 1962 era there, uh, a little bit before they let one of the greatest players that ever played at Essen, in Bobby Schumann, at 20 years of age, go over to South Australia. They let him go. Uh, from, but they, they wouldn't match a few dollars extra to keep him. And uh, But there's a lot of people who will come and tell you, and especially in that book, about if Shearman had been at Essendon in 63, 64, um, we might have been a far better team. So it comes down to a few administrative errors. And it could be a, an injured player, it could be a moment in a game, a, a, a missed goal. There's all these fine little things that make this game so great for us to watch. But for those yeah, of you who are close to it, it, it would be so frustrating um, when those opportunities fly by. I think Dick Reynolds had the most frustrating time in 1951 when uh, his best player at the time, John Coleman, was rubbed out just before the, the finals and didn't play in the grand final against Geelong. And many Geelong players say, who were in that winning team say that if Coleman had a play, uh, Essendon would have won uh, because we're only beaten by 10 points or something and the great John Coleman... <laughs> he would have uh, made the difference or could have made the difference. So you're dead right in saying a player here and there being injured or suspended could have made the big difference. Because I think you hear this sort of stuff all the time, don't you, in terms of, oh, yeah, but if he had have played, you know. But I think the, the thing that people forget is that if he's your number one player, he's being replaced by your number 21 or 22 or 23, depending upon which era. Uh, so it's not as though, oh, your number one player goes out, so your number one player comes in to replace him. It's, uh, it, it's usually a big, big skill gap, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. Uh, watching uh, the uh, 
a series on TV about the Bombers. It was interesting about 68 with Essendon when Ken Fraser, one of the greatest players and captain, uh, he was out injured. And uh, they brought in Jeff Lethem, a 17-year-old schoolboy, and kicked four goals. So that's an interesting situation with Ken Fraser of uh, kicked four goals in that game or be instrumental in four goals. And uh, their Football is a strange game. Uh, it can go either way. Jeff Blethyn, of course, uh, obviously was doing a lot of part-time work doing his Buddy Holly tribute show with those glasses. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Tony Good. Southcombe was the, and Jeff Blethyn were the last two players I remember playing with uh, with glasses on. It's quite a spectacle, wasn't it? It was quite a spectacle, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, I want to talk about another stage of the club, not, not such a good one, and it's probably relevant to all this good information on the history of the um, the James Heard era, the, it, it really damaged the club's reputation. Uh, it certainly damaged their ability to perform on the ground. And at the moment, they're coming out of a really long rebuild on the back of that. Um, some really good news about the Essendon Footy Club historically at a time to keep uh, members up and about, um, keep interest in the place is probably timely. Uh, are you, as a great Essendon man, are you finding that the club's now come out of that dark era? Oh, certainly. Um, the ca- the, uh, the coach, Paul Basher, has done a fantastic job in uh, trying to revive the culture of the club. I can recall that Dick Reynolds and John Coleman, Hutchie particularly, they built up a fantastic culture at Essendon. Uh, and it's hard to define what you mean by culture, but it's it's something in the club that re- people really love and players want to come and play for you. They love the culture and all that sort of thing. And we lost a lot of that. And in the past year or so, or a couple of years, um, Essendon are regaining that tremendous uh, culture that they had back in the days. of. Uh, and look, Sheeds was fantastic. We, we went through a bad time in the 70s, winning, did not winning a premiership. And Sheeds brought tremendous uh, amount of culture back into the club. We lost it for a while, but now it is so important that uh, Paul Brasher and everybody around the club, they're, they're attracting players now. And, you know, until a couple of years ago, players were wanting to leave the club, uh, but now they're wanting to stay and play. Like the signing of Zach Merritt uh, and uh, Parrish and these blokes was just a fantastic thing to help uh, the supporters of our club. Yeah, Darcy Paris, an interesting one, uh, John, well known around here, come up through the Geelong and District Footy League Club, Winchelsea, and I know him and the family well, and he genuinely loves the place. So if a country boy comes into a, a city club and is taken by the culture, I think you're probably right in suggesting it's turned turned for the better. And as much as we non-Essendon supporters don't want to see you successful, a successful Essendon means a successful competition and uh, I don't think with what's happening at the moment uh, it'll be too far away before we see them as regular finalists again No, and I think those episodes of the Bombers that's been on Fox Telly have really shown how important a great culture in the club was back in the days of um, Reynolds, Coleman and then Sheedy so that's something I think we're, we're getting back to. Uh, and uh, like uh, I must brag about Adrian Nadoro. I, I think Adrian Nadoro is one of the best recruiting people in the AFL. Uh, and he's been able to gather in the last couple of years some terrific um, recruits um, for the club. But what I'm bragging about is that I taught him at school of Essendon Grammar School, so I don't know if I taught him anything about football. <laughs> but I bet you he's heard the story about uh, Ballarat College, Burton and Pat. Um, <laughs> one thing that does sit in my mind, John, and, I, and maybe I'm looking for something that's not there, the move out to Tullamarine and away from Windy Hill, the one time that you and I met face-to-face was a, a fantastic event that was held at Windy Hill and uh, for the Premiership players, and... You know, I've called VFL football games from there for the Bombers uh, and also VFLW games. And you look at the ground and it looks tired and it looks like it's it's steeped in history. But Essendon, probably more than any other club, given what they've been through in the last few years, needed a new start. And maybe the, the Tunnel Marine move has helped with that? Oh, yes. It's a fantastic venue out there. Uh, the two grounds, like a lot of thought has gone into it and... Uh, what else is happening out there is that we had a, a fantastic memorabilia 
inspection at Windy Hill, and that didn't happen uh, so much out of Tullamarine, but I believe they've uh, finished a new memorabilia section out there because I, I think at that memorabilia section at Windy Hill, it would have been the best in the AFL, and thousands of people used to go through that each year, and I'm hoping, or I know, that it will happen out of Tullamarine now. But just the facilities out there, uh, no wonder players nowadays want to go and play with us, because to go out and see those facilities is fantastic. Uh, John, I've mentioned earlier that you've had a constant involvement in footy at the highest level. You're a uh, car- Current work with the AFL Premiership Players Association is great and, and Neil Menchel mentioned that we had the privilege of going to uh, dinner there. I've been to two of them. It's it's fantastic to wander around in a room with, with the, the greats of the game. You and your committee keep that happening. Um, this constant involvement, lots of stories, and I, you mentioned, interesting, that the, the favourite one was in 1954 before the, the real journey, the real footy journey started for you. Um, a lot, a lot's happened. John, is there a book in there somewhere? A book? Yeah. Is there a book that you could write about your life and times in football? It would be a shame if these stories weren't put in print. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be flattered, but uh, I think one of the chapters in this book from 62, 65, each of the players have got a chapter, I think, so there'll be a, a few stories of, of mine that come in there and... Uh, uh, I, I think that there are so many things that people don't know about the Essendon Football Club. You know, like, for example, back in the um, in the 60s, the era that we were talking about, um, somebody asked uh, what was going on between Brian Sampson and John Coleman in that era, you know, because they never got on, and the story came out they never got on. But who knew why they didn't get on? And then some of the players have come up with stories now about why they didn't get on. And uh, that's the attraction of the book. But as far as myself goes, um, oh, well, I, I, I'm probably a little bit modest, I suppose. But uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I've been able to stay in footy uh, from that time from Ballarat College and then playing with Ballarat and going to Essendon. And, and, and like, I've been sacked a couple of times in footy. Uh, one was by Essendon in uh, 71 as coach. But I was very fortunate that the great Jack Collins uh, asked me to go over and be an assistant coach at, um, at Footscray. And then when I got the sack at Collingwood in the late 90s, Jack Collins rang me again and said, uh, would you like to come on board and be a member of the Premiership Players Club, where I'm still involved after 20-something years and... Uh, I'm now the acting president. So, yeah, I've loved my time in footy. One of the things I'm fascinated by, John, and, and given Rob and I were talking about you before we started the program, in, in what can loosely be described as research, and uh, we were talking about people like you who've been involved at the highest level at various clubs. Clearly you're an Essendon man, and clearly you'll always be an Essendon man, but I'm fascinated by someone who then you know, has got that in their blood and fronts up at, at Footscray and coaches against Essendon. I think of someone like Bernie Quinlan, who played 150 games both with the Bulldogs and the Lions. How, how that works in terms terms of your affection for a club? Well, it's an interesting point because uh, one of the uh, things that I really treasure uh, about my footy was that uh, I was only a one-club player. Mm. Uh, But I was able then to uh, get various roles in other clubs. And you always, if you're a one-club player, you sort of remain that, uh, you know, I'm known as an Essendon player. And I believe that is very, I'm very proud of that. It's an interesting story that uh, when I went to Collingwood, um, I used to have this old lady that uh, from the cheer squad that used to stand outside uh, my office, and she'd often say, "Oh, you Essendon mongrel!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, she tidied it up then. <laughs> <laughs> I would look at her and say, "Yes," and I'm proud of it. Yeah, but uh, but I did have one uh, one time when I, I had mixed emotions, and that was in 1990 in the grand final when Collingwood played uh, uh, Essendon and my, my feelings, I loved Essendon, but I felt for players because there were quite a few of those players that I'd recruited at Collingwood and I was looking out for them like the Darren Mullanes and Mickey McGuans and those folks 
and uh, I was voting for them, but uh, deep down, I suppose, I was hoping the Bombers would win, but I shouldn't say that. <laughs> No, it, it's interesting. It's those little tidbits, John, that I, I think um, it's a story that could be told. So hopefully someone knocks on your door very shortly and says, John, let's sit down and write a book about your life and time because I think it would be well worth um, touching on some of the things you've touched on very briefly this morning uh, that, are, that are great interest. So let's say we get it before, um, well, before it's too late, John, I suppose. Before That's the nicest way of putting it. Yeah. I'm nearly 85. Yeah, I know. Yeah. The interesting thing is that Huey Mitchell, my great mate, is turning 87 on the 22nd of November. And uh, we're the two oldest living players from the 62 Premiership. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Yeah, well, you need to uh, get that stuff out of your head onto a bit of paper, John. <laughs> All right. I implore you. But Huey Mitchell, I always thought he had a hyphenated surname as being Huey Mitchell at the Junction Oval because three KZ used to say, now it's down to Huey Mitchell at the Junction Oval uh, when they used to do round the grounds. That's where he, he always seemed to be at the Junction Oval watching my Lions play. I've, um, yeah. I've promised the listeners a Huey Mitchell interview one day and for the reasons I've just said to you, John, I think we might hurry that up because he is in Geelong, still uh, at it, Leopold, if uh, my uh, research is correct, so it'll be very good to have a chat to him what because he's a great storyteller as well. Yeah, better get me out there with him because he doesn't have a mobile. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you'll be my conduit. We'll, when COVID passes, John, which hopefully soon he'll be, a, we might get him and John Newnham in the studio together one day and you can really go for it. No, he, uh, both of those folks, I, I spoke to Huey Mitchell, I spent Melbourne Cup Day with him uh, and then John Newnham the next day rang me and we had a great, great old chat too. So, uh, yeah, they're two terrific blokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, they're uh, both listening this morning. I hope Mr. Newnham's listening up there at in the hills at uh, Dean's Marsh. John, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. I look forward to again, uh, as I said, uh, to the day we can have you back in the studio here is a day I do look forward to when we can talk more about the old days because genuine football lovers love those stories. That uh, I mean, you touched on the thing then, a relationship between a coach and a player from the 60s that many people may remember but yeah let's talk about why things like that happen because it's it's always interesting it doesn't matter um, which club it is those sorts of stories always have interest for we football lovers and you know you, you don't know about this even if you're in the same team <laughs> and uh, you know Ken Fraser told me the other day a story as, as to why Brian Sampson played better in finals than in the, the home and away game I never knew it but Ken and Brian knew it. So, uh, you know, stories like that are just fantastic. And, and I love the way you're not telling us the story, so we'll go and buy the book. Well done, you. You, you should be in marketing. <laughs> you, want the, you want me to tell you the story? <laughs> yeah, you've got time. Quickly yeah. tell us the Brian Sampson final story. Well, it was... Um, Brian was a brick player, and uh, his um, boss used to make him work right up until late Friday afternoon, but in, and sometimes Saturday morning. But then in, when it was finals... His boss let him off Friday, so he finished work on Thursday night. Ah. Flat. So that would make a bit of difference, wouldn't it? I would have thought so. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the prima donnas that play now who <laughs> get a bit sad because they've got the wrong flavoured Gatorade after the game. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> John Burt, it's always a thrill to have a chat to someone who, uh, despite being modest, is a legend of our game, and we love chatting to people like you. So good on you, mate. Thanks very much, guys. All the best. Johnny Burt. Yeah, John, but one of the great things about people like that is they're so unassuming. You imagine some of these clowns, there's one who's currently got himself in strife in the US. Can you imagine in 40 years' time sitting down with him and having a chat about his football career? I, I, I just, think not. I just want to relate to the story and, and the relativity of where we sit as football fans. But uh, John Burt sat in this very chair that I'm in now, perhaps not the chair, certainly mm. spoken to this microphone, and talked about the, the aura around... Reynolds, Coleman and Hutchison they had in his life to the point where he didn't feel worthy to of the their room. presence yeah. and to be spoken about in the same way that, that the Essendon Footy Club um, um, spoke about him. He, he, he felt unworthy. And then Johnny Newnham, the same, uh, a Fitzroy Rover, played over 100 games at Fitzroy, played eight times for Victoria, and he spoke about when he was at a, a, away on a carnival side and there's, there's the likes of Bert and Ian Stewart and... Ted Witt and Ron Barassi, he's in the same team as him. He said, I don't belong here. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And we're look, looking and saying, geez, you've played that VFL footy. What yeah. a great you are. Absolutely. It's all relative. It is indeed.